finding and acknowledging their power. By varying others, we are also acknowledging their power. This includes not just the CEO. It also includes the maitre d' at the fashionable restaurant, the administrative assistant who knows where the visor are, the hairy bureaucrat behind the window at the Department of Motor Vehicles, or the child or counterpart who can save or waste your time. Very what they do recognizes their position, capabilities, or perceptions. They will want to give you something in return. Even if they have little power, giving them power by acknowledging what they have control over will lead them to give you something back. This is the opposite of exerting your power over them. As a result, it has the opposite effect. People want to help you. So the next time a hotel club or a customer service representative on the phone or a guest station attendant or other service provider makes a mistake or doesn't give you exactly you what you want. Don't just tease them or treat them poorly. Doing so won't help you meet your goals. Instead, value them by acknowledging that they have the power to eat differently. This is the opposite of the typical reaction, but it works and works far more effectively. Don McLaurin, a management consultant, was at a crowded restaurant with a friend. The waiter didn't bring drinks despite four requests. Dodge Fred screamed at him, demeaning him, and the waiter walked away. Don followed him across the restaurant, a project for her friend and for cranky customers in general. If you could bring our things and a check, the next time you will have to come to our table is to pick up your tea, she said. Drinks arrived less than two minutes later. Instead of making him seem incompetent, I tried to see the situation from his viewpoint concept. The key is not being reactive even if the other person is in a bad mood. Often, people will lash out at you just because they are frustrated from some other encounter. Don't assume it's about you. Tell them you're sorry they're having a bad day. You will all the benefits. It takes discipline, but the rewards are worth it. You will face thousands of encounters like this in your life. How you choose to resolve them will have a significant effect on the quality of your life. Why? and acknowledging the other person's power also means finding the decision maker or the person with direct influence over the decision maker. 
How many of you have wasted hours of your lives negotiating with the wrong person? Everyone. When you pour someone off, you should know if the person can help. Hello, do you have the power to do as? Life is short. A French company had negotiated with a Korean company for three years. Every time the French company thought they had a deal, the Korean company kicked it off to the next level. After three years and the expenditure of $500,000 for travel and other expenses, not even counting the opportunity cost, the French company gave up. The reason they failed is that they hadn't asked what they should have asked at week one. That is, what does this process look like? Who makes the decisions? Closely related to that is, who is the right negotiator? It may not be the most skilled or senior person. Indeed, studies have shown that the more power people are, the less attention they pay to other size needs. That means the less successful they will be at expanding the path. It's a real irony that that some of the most junior members of a team might end up being the best negotiators. <clears throat> so your question should be, who on my team will be most likely to get the other party to meet my goals? An important way to empower them to really use is to give them the problem. News, empathy, or just ask them for help. When you involve people in your problem, they will feel empowered. They will take ownership. They will be more likely to help you Ask them for help. In all of my years as a negotiator, I did one advisory session for the CIA. Someone at the Inspector General's office called me. It seemed the administration was being overwhelmed with employee grievances. Management couldn't handle that, so I went down to Langley, Virginia. I told them that a good way to reduce the number of employee grievances was to give the problem away to the employees. Form an employee grievance committee. Put various employees on it. Have people rotate in and out, say, every six months. Offer a small bonus for it, or a positive letter in the employee file, that sort of thing. All grievances from employees would first go to the Employee Grievance Committee for review. If the committee approved, the grievances would then be forwarded to management. In such a situation, the number of employee grievances goes way down. People feel embarrassed bringing frivolous or vindictive grievances to their peers. 
bodies left at the legitimate complaint, ask your colleagues, bosses, and employees for advice on how to solve your problem. And let them know you might not accept every answer, but you will get more. Trust. A colleague was a friend of mine for almost 20 years. One day, he saw an opportunity and appropriated for himself a project we had worked on together for more than a decade. Spouses are married for years, suddenly one cheat and poop. The marriage is over. Clearly, trust is a major people issue. The benefits of trust are huge. Faster deals, more deals, bigger results. Not having it is costly. A French study showed that there is so little trust among people in France that employment is 8% lower and gross national product is 5% lower than they could be. The comparison country was Sweden. This is a multi-billion dollar difference. In general, Scandinavian countries and the United States had the most trust. Part of the economic problem in many developing countries is that transaction costs are so high because there is very little trust. Part of the economic problem in the United States is that since 9-11, Trust among people and institution has dropped. So transactions such as airport security or roads are more time consuming and costly. This takes away money that could be used for more productive enterprises. A 2009 Danish study found a direct correlation between societal trust and foreign investment, especially with the hated lower trust rate in post-communist and developing countries. A large defined trust, trust is a feeling of security that the other person will protect you. With some trust, another person will help you and it's too risky for them or a better opportunity comes along. With a lot of trust, the other party will help you even if it harms them. It is very important to understand the trust dynamic. The major component of, a, of trust is honesty. Being straight with people, trust does not mean that both sides agree with each other or are always present to each other. It does mean, however, that the parties believe each other. Your credibility, as I mentioned earlier, is the most important negotiation tool you have. The opposite of trust is, of course, dishonesty or lie. It includes any action that devises other people. That includes telling the truth in such a way that you omit facts 
and create a false impression. It can be clever manipulation of emotions. It can be the distorting of information, bluffing, making threats or promise you don't intend to carry out, undermining the credibility of others through selectively charged information. Each anything that does pass the smell test, a lie destroys trust and ultimately hurts successful negotiations. You have to make sure there is a basis for trust. If someone you have just met in a business situation said to you, don't you trust me? Your answer invariably should be something like, why should I trust you? We just met each other, and if you trust me on that basis, you are crazy. Trust is something that develops slowly over time. It is an emotional commitment to one another based on mutual respect, ethics, and good feeling. It includes the notion that people care about others and will not try to grab everything for themselves. If you are unsure of the relationship, don't trust the other person. Don't make yourself vulnerable to them. The right response to an untrustworthy person is not to be untrustworthy back. Why destroy your credibility just because they have destroyed theirs. A colleague, Michel Marx, was chairman of the New York Merchant Car Exchange from 1974 to 1986. He invented energy futures, a trillion dollar industry. I once asked him, for the secret of his success. I always leave money on the table, Mr. said. I never leave them with nothing. He added that people trusted him, so he, they brought him deals, and he did more deals, and he said he did each deal Master. So he did a lot more deals. Mr. was no Pepsi. He didn't expose his truth when he wasn't sure of the trust situation. But he made his credibility the major part of his own competitiveness and his value. And I am asked, is a pretty transactional short term place as popularized in the, in the Eddie Murphy movie Trading Places. Now, lawyers might say, how is living money on the table? consistent with my responsibility to jealously represent my client? My answer would be over one time frame. If you take everything today and then want to deal with you again, have you really gotten your client the most that was available to you? of all variable time frames. 
some people may say that trust varies from culture to culture. That's true. But it is also true that the more the human connection in any culture, the more trust. And lack of trust still has a cost. Some years ago, I conducted a negotiation workshop in Moscow for a number of the most successful businessmen in the former Soviet Union. After the first morning, three of the participants took me to lunch to send me straight. All this stuff about collaboration is very nice for your students in the West. One of them said, but it is relevant to us. Whenever we want something, we just steal it. But three of them chuckled, but they mean it. I asked about bribery. Yes, they said they bribe people too. I said to them, this may work for you today inside Russia, but the international business community won't stand for it. And it will cost you in the long run. Of course, they didn't believe me. In 1998, the Russian banking scandal erupted. The U.S. banks lost billions of dollars due to bank fraud in Russia. U.S. investment in Russia dropped from 28% of the world quarter to 2.9%. If you want to ask many international financiers about Russia, the first association that would come to mind is cheating. Even if each minority of people involved is expensive, The French study cited earlier said that about 90% of the people in Russia had no trust at all in the justice system compared to about 23% in the United States and about 12% in Norway. The two countries found to have the highest degrees of trust. Lie and bluffing in negotiations feel risky. People can call your bluff if each organization or different people tell different lies, someone on the other side will eventually detect it. Internally, lying or bluffing may cause dissension and distrust among those with higher ethical standards. Someone may detect the inconsistencies and use them against you. That does mean you have to tell the other person everything. As noted in Chapter 1, tell them you are not ready to disclose something at this point. If the relationship develops, you can disclose more. It also helps to figure out what they are really, really asking. A woman moved away from 
caught my heart neighborhood or came back to one of her former local stores a short time later to buy some music CDs. She wanted about $150 worth at check out counter. The manager asked if she lived in the neighborhood. There was a discount for neighbors. Her question later to the class was, should she have lied? She did not and paid full price. What was the manager's real question? Did he give a food where she lived? No, he wanted to know if she was a frequent customer. Why couldn't she have answered? I used to live in the neighborhood. I uh, recently moved away, but I come back just to shop at the stores that I love. This is one of them. Isn't that more powerful than lying? It is part to what he was really asking. What if she lied and showed her driver's license with her old address and the manager knew someone else had moved in there? Stores do have databases. She be tossed forever in that store. To provide the point, the student went back to the store and told the manager what the class recommended, she said, and she got the discount after the purchase. It may take a little more thought about the other party and the situation, but the results involve less risk and more gain over time. Negotiating without trust. As we know, the world is of an untrustworthy place. How do you negotiate in situations where there is a lack of trust? After all, on first what people pay money to. The fact is, although trust is best, you don't need it for successful negotiations. This is a big point, and most people miss it. Trust is not the major requirement for a successful negotiation. Something much more fundamental is needed. What is needed? A commitment. Trust is only one way to get a commitment. Contract, third parties, and incentives are other ways to obtain commitment. The important thing is you need to get a commitment in the way they make commitments, not in the way you make commitments. Be worried, your bond. Who cares? With their word, their bond, don't just assume that because you make a commitment one way. They make a commitment the same way. You should spend as much energy on getting commitment that you are sure you commit them as you spend in setting your goals. <clears throat> U.S. companies doing business in China have wines that many traditional Chinese companies don't use contracts to make 
price commitment. They make commitment differently. First, the Chinese company gets the structure of the deal done in a contract. Supply, delivery, less, and so forth. Then they look at the market and propose pricing based on market condition. Prices in context are viewed as advisory. Indeed, the China Economic Review said in April 2010 that Westerners who don't plan for such a second post contract negotiation should plan on failing. However, if an elder of the community in China is backed by the company, announces in the press that this contact with its embedded pricing formula is an excellent example of US-China cooperation. Now that would be much more of a commitment. That's because that saving is more important in both business and personal behavior in China. A U.S. consulting firm was owed a substantial debt by one of the largest companies in China. This debt was 700 days old, almost two years. The U.S. company tried attorneys and it didn't work. They tried diplomacy and it opened the door a little for a meeting. I suggested to the US company that its executives meet in person with the head of this traditional Chinese company and say something like, You are not paying this debt has dishonored us. It has dishonored us in front of our colleagues. It has dishonored us in front of our friends. It has dishonored us in front of our families. It has dishonored us in front of our employees, consultants, customers, governments, neighborhoods, and communities. Moreover, the Chinese company should be advised that the non-payment has also dishonored them in front of their own government. That's because China was trying for international trade respect. Not paying legitimate business debts for work performed is against international standards. The Chinese company paid the debt in full within three weeks. In many markets in the Middle East, a handshake is a binding commitment. One trader sticks out his head, arm straight, and says, How about this price? Give me your head. The other trader snaps his arm behind his back, offer not accepted. The negotiation continues. If they reach a deal, they shake hands in front of witnesses by the commitment for several years 
all of my companies exported bananas from the jungles of Bolivia to Argentina. In the particular markets we dealt with in Argentina, I found out that the foreign statement or not commitment. I swear, I swear on my mother's life. I promise I signed the contract. I absolutely guarantee it. But if we owed them money, they would keep the agreement at least until we paid them. So we developed a structure in which they paid the upfront cost of ripening, delivery, sales, and food. We received the payment from the ultimate consumers here, supermarket. Then we paid our partner for their cost and profit split. In the six years that we dealt with that, they never broke any harm of the agreement. Did I trust them? I didn't even know them. So here is a key. In the absence of trust, you need a mechanical substitute to give them an incentive not to cheat. It can be a monetary structure as above. It can be money in escrow or potential negative opinions by third parties. It can be the net present value of future profits from the deal. As the singer Tina Turner also said, what's love got to do with it? In a negotiation, trust is nice, but not necessary. There are many other ways to protect yourself against lying or cheating by the other party. The first is being incremental. Give a real information or value that doesn't cost much if you get cheated. See if you get something back in kind. If so, go a little further. Be careful that you don't get into a sting situation where you have given a lot and they have given little that's of value to you. Make sure you get sufficient value in return each step of the way. A Ukrainian businessman Alex Dugat said, that when he meets someone in a business meet setting, for the first few months, he always asks questions to which he already knows the answers. If they lie, I don't dare read them again. If they tell the truth, I go to the next step, he said. There are other ways to test them. Ask them to prove to a third party that their other offer is bona fide. Tell them that you will give them better prices and terms up to your limit. Which only the third party will know. The third party would then give you any other offers against yours. 
if your offer is better, the other party gets the money. You have deposited with the third party. If they work, you should become suspicious of their veracity. I like former President Ronald Reagan's comment about the Soviet Union. Trust, but verify. It's an old Russian proverb. Here's a list of things for you to keep in mind. If they have a lot more information than you do, you are vulnerable. Be incremental and don't make commitment until you have more information or a lot of trust. Collect lots of information, due diligence on that. Ask them for details. See if all the information matches up. Check and test everything. Use trusted third parties to help. Do they invade your question or change the subject? The more secretive they are, the more risk there is that they are hiding something. If, if it would be more profitable for them to cheat, then be honest, change the incentives. For example, compensate them for performance. They provide over time. Don't provide your asset in that invention type building without explicit protections. Make guarantees of truthfulness part of any agreement. Tell them it will give me comfort and cost you nothing if when you say it's true, if they work, watch out. Put in your agreement the consequences of breaking the agreement. Meet in person is harder to hide things. In some cultures, many parties will not negotiate except in person. Where the parties can observe each other. If you feel uncomfortable that something has been left unsaid, ask them, is there anything else I should know? Trust your instinct. Is the other person nervous, looking guilty, trying too hard, looking away? unless it's culture. Keeping long silences. Decline to make commitment. These are not conclusive evidence of dishonesty. But they should raise questions. They cause you to go slower, ask more questions, be more Incremental. Getting more also means not getting less. Take the trouble to follow these guidelines. Don't be sorry later. Losing and regaining trust. A thousand years from now, someone will look up newspaper articles for the 21st century and see an 
obituary of the widely respected style queen, Martha Stewart. The article restarted with something like Martha Stewart, who changed the way the world viewed the style and who was indicted and convicted for lying to a grand jury died yesterday, cheating, or even the perception of cheating is forever. Well, let's say you are at a law firm. You overbill a client once in your career by $1,000, you get found out for the rest of your life, people will look at you as the attorney who overbills. The law firm will be looked at as the law firm that overbills. It just takes once. The cause of cheating is loss of trust. The cost of loss of trust is actual dollars, reputation, and credibility, and your effectiveness as a negotiator. Mike Pappas, who won a record eight gold medals for swimming, in the 2008 Summer Olympics, lost millions of dollars in sponsorship contracts because he was found smoking marijuana once. He still does sponsorship, but a fraction of the opportunity he had before. And of course, we all know what happened to the endorsement career of pro golfer Tiger Woods when he was discovered to be cheating on his wife. In class negotiation sessions, there are opportunities for one own party to cheat another. Once, a lawyer and a law student made an agreement with each other during a negotiation. The student team broke the agreement and beat the lawyer's team soundly. The lawyer was outraged. He stood up in front of this large class and said to the student, I have all the information I need about you for the rest of your life. The student responded, Hey, lighten up. It's just a game. To which the attorney said, If this is what you will do for point, just think. What you will do for mine? Even the perception of cheating can destroy negotiation and the relationship that go with them. One manager in my Columbia University executive MBA course said, he was working for an industrial equipment manufacturer that 10 years before had a problem with each major customer of the contract for the annual purchase. The client was buying $80 million a year in equipment. In the contact negotiation, the client 
specifically opposed a particular pricing formula. The vendor agreed to take it out. It didn't affect much of the purchase. And it was far down in the contract. But it had been heavily negotiated. When the contract was finished, the vendor signed it and sent it to the customer. As the customer purchasing people were going through the contract, the purchasing manager discovered that, lo and behold, the pricing formula was still in the contract. The customer was revealed, said it had been cheated. The vendor apologized profusely, but no matter. The customer didn't believe the vendor since the formula had been so heavily negotiated. For 10 years after that, the customer bought nothing from that vendor. You know, with inflation, it cost the vendor $1 billion in sales. After 10 years, there was no one left in the vendor's senior management who had been involved in that deal at the customer's company there was only one person left. It was the CEO, who happened to have been the purchasing manager 10 years before. One of the most dramatic and applicable examples of the effects of loss of trust concerns a customer of a big producer of can. The customer was a large printing plant in central New Jersey. The purchasing manager told me he was buying less than 10% of each chemical lease from the vendor, perhaps $100,000 a year. He said his company could be buying at least $500,000 a year, perhaps much more. But he said, instead of getting this business, the vendor had lost the printing plan as a client in 1990, 11 years earlier. In fact, 2001 was the first time the printing plant had bought anything from the vendor since 1990. What happened? I asked. Well, the purchasing manager said in 1990, the company tried to force a new product on us, saying the old product was no longer available. The new product didn't perform and we lost production time. Then he said, he found that the so-called new product was actually test material. As a result, he said, trust was lost. He said, the vendor lost more than $1 million in business from each firm. So why did you, did you start again? I asked. Well, he said, the company's sales reps has been great. He's been coming around, giving us information, really nice guy. So we thought we would give him a shot at the account again.
this explains the relatively small order in 2001, the purchasing manager said. How long has the sales rep been coming around trying to win the account back? I asked every month for six years. The purchasing manager said. It is possible to regain trust after you have lost it. It's not easy, of course, and it's not very safe. Your request can resonate if you frame it in terms of a second chance. The process needs to be incremental. You have to be polite. You have to apologize, you have to promise to do better, said Vera Nakova, a senior marketing manager for Sanofi Aventis Pharmaceuticals, who gave a second chance to an underperforming market research vendor. You have to be open to change. You need to discuss past miscommunications. She said a key to the establishing trust is to demonstrate your ability to collaborate and solve the problems that have occurred. Changing everything, having an understanding of people through the tools and strategies in this chapter can have extraordinary results. Here is one from Dr. Chris Sibtani, a former student of mine at Columbia Business School, about 27-year-old autistic patient named John. Chris, who is now a portfolio manager at UBS, was a pediatric anesthesiologist at Memorial Sloan Kathleen's Cancer Center in Manhattan during the 1990s. <clears throat> John, the adult patient, was non-communicative and uncooperative. He repeatedly became violent when he when approached with needles for tests. I thought about his needs and who he was as a person. Chris said he simply needed more concrete reassurance and had more limited coping mechanism. Chris realized that John was afraid of pain and symbol of pain. So he made a display of putting away visible needs. Chris also realized that John hated being talked down to. So he sat next to him at eye level and had a nurse call me a lie down on a nearby stretcher. This acknowledged John's power and valued him. Chris figured that John disliked surprises, so the doctor made very slow movements. Chris demonstrated the use of monitors on himself first, then on John's mother, while both smiled human connection. Chris knew 
John was hungry before the test, so he raised the anesthetic mask with a sweet strawberry scent and let the smell fall over to John. Because John rocked and hung sometimes, Chris did the same, hobbing, who's afraid of the big bad wolf. Be assured, calm and cooperative, John went quietly off to sleep. You can move even the most difficult people a long distance by figuring out who they are, valuing them, and giving them even a little more control.